Hi everybody, Andy here. Just before we start this week's show, we have two exciting announcements to make. The first is about who our special guest is this time, and the second is about a live show we have coming up. So firstly, our guest this week is the brilliant comedian Rachel Paris. Rachel's been on once before, but if you haven't heard of her or you didn't hear that episode, she is a fantastic writer, comedian, presenter, musician, you name it. She's in Ostentatious, the Jane Austen-themed uh, improvised comedy show. She also is in the throes of publishing her first ever book. It's called Advice from Strangers, Everything I Know from People I Don't Know. Uh, she toured around for a year asking her live audience for advice, and this book is the brilliant result. It's funny, it's uplifting. The advice ranges from be kind to never pass up the opportunity for a wee, it spans the gamut. It's a brilliant book and it's out in paperback now, so do check it out. The second thing to say is that we have a live No Such Thing As A Fish coming up on the 21st of April, and this is a global streaming event. Very exciting. We're doing a show at the British Library, the world hallowed British Library, uh, as part of their season, special season, all about animals. It's called Fantastic Beasts, and we're going to be having a very special guest on the show, and the show will be streamed globally if you go do no such thing as a fish.com forward slash live you'll be able to get streaming tickets so you can sign up buy a ticket and watch from the comfort of your own home wherever in the world you are from Kettering to Kalamazoo all the tickets as I say at no such thing as a fish.com slash live we hope to see you there all right that's it on with the show Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber, I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray and Rachel Paris and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in a particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, that is Rachel. My fact is... Dame Maura Limpany remains the only castaway on Desert Island Discs to have chosen entirely her own recordings to be marooned with. <laughs> <laughs> Which I admire. Me yeah. too. Bold. Great idea. <laughs> straight in. I, so, I feel like I should say straight away, like, in her defence. Yeah. It was her second appearance on the show. Uh, her first was 22 years earlier, and she didn't want to repeat any of her choices and there probably she, hadn't been any music in exactly. the that's the problem <laughs> back in the day there was eight songs so yeah, that's yeah, yeah that was a big problem <laughs> we should quickly say because uh, our British listeners will obviously know what Desert Island Discs is but probably not the young ones not the young ones possibly yeah but and international people won't know it either this is <laughs> well, children and foreigners <laughs> <laughs> lend me your a when new it, book by Sally Rooney <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's um, it's the UK's, I believe, longest running radio show. If not, it's right up there at the top. It's an interview show, and the basic premise of it is you bring eight records onto the show, songs you love that mean something to you, and then at the end you're asked to make a decision. You're going to be marooned on a desert island. What one song are you going to save while the seven other wash away? And you get to bring a book, and you get to bring a luxury item. And it's awesome. It's my favourite radio show. Yeah, and they use that to talk about their life and thoughts mm. and everything as well. Mm. Um, so it's really like esteemed, isn't it, in British culture. Uh, I think it was Dame Elizabeth Schwarzkopf who did a lot of her own recording. She was a soprano, mm. but it was only uh, Maura Limpany who chose entirely her own yeah. recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that Schwarzkopf picked seven out of eight, it featured her voice. And was Dame Maura yeah. Limpany, she was a... She was a pianist. 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 Okay, pianist. Okay, okay, okay. Is it pianist? Pianist. 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 Lead pianist. into the. There's a hinge in pian. And that pian. Helps. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> pianist. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to her, Limpany, she didn't pick songs composed by her. They were Mozart songs mm. and they were Chopin and stuff like that. So they were all they were all classical pieces that she was playing on. But then you get people like Norman Wisdom, who is, uh, for, for children and overseas <laughs> people, he was a comedian, uh, very big in Albania. I mean, anyone under 80 is going to struggle <laughs> with Norman Wisdom. And he, what about him? Well, he chose five of his eight oh, as yeah. his own songs, but I think his actual oh, own wow. songs, Don't Laugh at Me Because I'm a Fool, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, someone yes. who chose three of their own uh, for foreigners and not for children. <laughs> children was Rolf Harris. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the edit. <laughs> wow. Weird one weird one was David Frost, 
who picked David Frost interviews. <laughs> so not even oh, music. Uh, Nixon? Did he do the Nixon one? Um, he must have done. I'm not sure that he that did, was, bizarrely. Wow, really? With those people, I, I do wonder if... Was it just a matter of having not thoroughly researched what the <laughs> programme is? Yeah. <laughs> well, it could be. In the so, early days, I think. It's so eminent. Be- these days, being invited on de- Desert Island Desk is basically, in Britain, it's kind of a minor gong. Yeah. It's like getting a, a, an MBE or yeah. something. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I'm sure you guys found out that lo- some people have done it twice. That's pretty eminent. That's like double gong. Mm. Yeah. And you've got some people who've done it three times. I need two people, as far as I can tell, have done it four <gasps> times. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Do we get to guess who? You have a guess. Someone like uh, Maggie Smith. Oh, yeah, nice. even I would say even more eminent. David Attenborough. Attenborough. Oh wow! Yes. And if you guys guess the other one without having it, having read about uh, it, already. yeah, oh, you've already. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're gonna, out of the I was going to try and <laughs> worm my way in somehow. Wait, I don't know. Is um, it one of the Chuckle Brothers? It's Barry Chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and his luxury was Paul Chuckle, which was nice. Yeah. Sorry, is it actually Barry? No, 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 no. <laughs> don't do that. I believed you. But it is a comedian, isn't it? From old. Yeah, um, Arthur Askey. So oh, not a name really? that cuts a lot of ice right. today. But um, like a music hall guy, was he? Yeah, yeah. A really, a really, really famous comedian yeah. in the 50s and 40s and 50s. Yeah. yeah. Um, the original host was a guy called Roy Plombley yeah, who invented yeah. it. And he invented it in the during the Second World War, actually. It was a, a sort of wartime commission to you know cheer people up and it was just clearly a good idea. But he was incredibly austere about it. And in fact, he was so controlling that the early shows were scripted. Yeah. So oh, really? he would script each dialogue in advance and then they'd just sit and they'd read the script, him really? and the interviewee. And then that was it. And it was wow. largely just about the music, wasn't it? It was it was it was basically <laughs> like being Zoe Ball and sort of going, Let's listen to this next track. It was you know, they were DJing to an extent. Um well, also he would ask about whether you could survive on a desert island, as in he was incredibly interested in he, <laughs> he would ask us like <laughs> so Can you build your own shelter? Can you fish? Can you swim? You know, what are you gonna do about the sun? It like it was it that's was great. almost purely That feels like that's, that's what it should be. It was yeah. really it was really fun, I think. Do you know that's before right. he pitched this, uh so that he was like twenty seven, I think, when he pitched mm. this and uh, oh, so he came up with it. Did he? he came yeah. up with it oh. and he thought that it was going to be six episodes and that was it he thought they, they paid him quite wow. well I mean, so did we at the start of the <laughs> yeah. first thing a fish. <laughs> um, and so it was a shock that it lasted for him like 41 years and wow. became this national yeah. institution but before that he he was a, he used to pitch shows to the BBC and one of the shows he pitched was called I Know What I Hate and it was a <laughs> <laughs> it was a show in which guests choose songs that they hated and they were just have them, you know, either, you know, Room 101, basically, I wow. guess. The pre-Room right. 101. Imagine if you got them mixed up and your Dame Mora <laughs> Lempany. <laughs> you just bring your own songs. Has Desert Island Discs ever had a gap? Or is it just run continuously? It has, yeah. In the early days it had. Yeah. I think these days they only do 40 a year. Oh, right, okay. They have a huh. few gaps. But there was, but there, was a, there was a couple of years of, like, five-year gap yeah, yeah, where yeah, it yeah, kind yeah, of just yeah. went right. off air altogether, yeah. He, he yeah. also did a panel show um, called Many a Slip, which sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so in a typical round, he would read out a piece of text and there would be some grammatical error in there and the panel had to find the grammatical what? error. <laughs> Bring it back. Isn't Bring that amazing? <laughs> uh, Absolutely love that. I would really enjoy being on the panel for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was reading the early guests, like the really, early, the, sort of the first 10 guests they yeah. had. So have, did you guys read at all about Captain Dingle? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Sounds great. He was unbelievably interesting so it's just listed as explorer right dan is very interested by this yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep talking well captain aylward edward dingle um was born in 1874 and then he was on the show in the mid 40s so he's pretty old by this point yeah and he was uniquely qualified to be on the show can you guess why he was especially good because he'd lived on a desert island he had lived on a desert oh, island himself nice. or he was a disc <laughs> <laughs> he was both he was a uniquely circular <laughs> guy no he he had been shipwrecked five times in his life brilliant yeah. wow it, oh my god in 1893 so he was 19 he was in a schooner called the black pearl he and his shipmate were going to retrieve gold from a sunken ship which was sunk 20 so years funny. before it was the black pearl from pirates of the caribbean yeah. it's the same yeah. one yeah yeah and so then they got shipwrecked and it was only two of them in this boat <laughs> And they spent 11 weeks on a desert island eating raw penguin and drinking rain. <gasps> wow. Um, there's, there's some good news, which is that while on the island, they found some other treasure from a different shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then, amazing and story. The, and the two of them got along so badly, these two, that they weren't speaking at all. For like a few days in, they were just not speaking for days on end. Right. So it's kind of understandable, that. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, completely. Yeah. 
God. This would make such a better episode of Desert Island Discs <laughs> than how difficult your childhood was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back. Bring back exclusive shipwreck guests. Wow, so, who's, but did, the, did Dingle's partner do an episode as well to sort of counter BBC no, I Balance? Don't, I don't think so. No? no. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> Can I just say one thing about Plumley? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, his grandfather was called Right Hey Ho. What? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> he was called Right Hey Ho, and his surname was Wig. So his first two names were Right, W R I G H T. Okay. And his middle name was Hey Ho, H A Y H O E. What? So he's called Right Hey Ho. Do we know what the story behind that? That's just the name. That's amazing. It's not one of those Bible things, is it? You know how people were no, named after just, just putting they, a... they were oh. just normal names. Back Imagine in the day. school, like the teacher goes, right, hey ho, <laughs> <laughs> everyone would start packing up and leave. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. There's an episode that Dan will be especially interested in. Oh, yeah. The Buzz Aldrin episode. Oh, okay. Which we've never heard. Okay. So it was, when, it was during Sue Lawley's tenure. Yeah. And she's, you know, okay. massively respected, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Amazing broadcaster. Yeah. And she and a production team went to Buzz Aldrin's house in California, yeah. right? Wow. And they were setting up, you know, doing all the sort of pre chat bits. And Buzz Aldrin left the room and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Wow. So they didn't make it. Where did you? Where, did they do it in 1969? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I've just got to quickly do something. <laughs> and that's why Lawley, fo- Lawley was second on the moon because she was trying to get the interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. That's amazing. Mm. Was that's he pissed so off or do we know? Do we don't know anything. Know. He just walked out. Okay. Mm. I don't know. You Someone don't. will know. Someone will know. Buzz will know. Yeah. Let's ask him. Let's ask him. I mean, he came on our show, came yeah. on Museum of Curiosity. Oh, came all wow. the way over here. We didn't even have to go to California. Yeah. You should have, you should have done a reverse <laughs> lawly on him. You the should entire have... audience yeah. leaves. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alistair MacLean, who was a novelist in the 20th century. Like a detective kind mm, of guy. Yeah, thriller, like Where Eagles Dare and uh, The okay. Guns of Navarone. Anyway, huge author, right? And, and Plomley was a mega fan. Loved Alistair MacLean. Really excited. And um, he arrived, and they were doing the, the pre-interview. You know, they were talking about just talking about what they're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, and as they were doing the pre-interview, Roy Plomley realised he was not talking to Alistair MacLean, the novelist. <gasps> he was talking to a guy called Alistair MacLean, who was the head of the European Tourist Bureau of the Government of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> He must have got the letter saying, can you come on Desert Island Discs and thought, finally, <laughs> my work has been appreciated. Why have they waited so long? <laughs> I've got so much to say about Canada. <laughs> That's amazing. Can you guess what we did? In I would say, I think you just dial it out, don't you? You have to just say, this is the person we've asked. It's I reckon point. he just Buzz aldrin it and just <laughs> walked out. Well... He stuck it out. They just recorded it anyway and then didn't broadcast it. Oh. Why did they not know? Was it just terrible? I have no idea, but it, I don't think it was I don't think it was broadcast in the end. That's but, a shame because, uh, yeah, it yeah. is a format that thrives on just someone you've never heard of because yeah. the songs yeah. allow you in. Yeah. As a Canadian, this guy would probably be quite good at wilderness survival. Yeah. Possibly. You know, Lots yeah. of islands in Canada. One of the most islands. Is it? I think that's absolutely heartbreaking for Alistair MacLean, yeah. the Canadian. Yeah. Like imagine you get the letter and you're so flattered and you're yeah. like, I knew actually that my life did mean something to people. <laughs> <laughs> this really validates everything that I've had doubts about, I'll be honest. Years of, <laughs> years of misery yeah. be, being the Thinking, head of the European worth, Tourist Bureau. Am I on the right path? And then you record, you even record it record and it goes fine. Yeah. And then it never airs and maybe you inquire why it's never aired. Yeah. They must have told him the tapes were burned in a fire. I hope so. I hope that's what yeah. they said. Yeah, the UK's burnt down, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and he'll be like, re- I can come back. I can redo it. And they'll be like, <laughs> no, uh, sorry, no. <laughs> we're booked. We're booked out. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Until 2023, we're booked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was oh, wondering God. how many islands there were, like in the Pacific, for instance, if you put one celebrity on each one. Would that, oh, yeah. <laughs> would would that they have that run out now? Up, but That's like, could you fit everyone I, who's been on Desert Island Discs onto their own individual island? I think island? even just in the Pacific, you would easily be able to do it. Wow, amazing. Yeah, but That's it wouldn't be good. good for the local flora and fauna. Yeah, what, uh, because, why not? Well, desert islands, usually they have lots of species on because there's no humans, there's no cats, there's no rats, mm. there's no... So it's quite good for, for species. But if you put 
you know, Barry Chuckle. On <laughs> <laughs> the insects will be hurting themselves on the pane of glass. He's accidentally yeah. smashed carrying. <laughs> um, there's a story. Uh, Herbert Morrison, who was a politician, he was sort of under Clement Attlee and his government. Um, he, when he when he died, he was found to have his eight songs in his wallet waiting. Oh. Should he ever be called at moment's notice to oh, suddenly appear wow. Wow. on Desert Island Discs? That's yeah. lovely. I uh, think quite similarly, I have on purpose learned all of the words to Trouble by Iggy Azalea, just in case I ever get asked to do a uh, celebrity lip sync. No way. Is that with oh, really? Jennifer Hudson? Yeah. Because I know the chorus. I will be your You can great. be Jennifer Hudson okay. and I'll be Iggy nice. Azalea. That's very good. It's this very much the same. And mm. equal esteem, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, um, I've actually learned a lot of ice skating moves in case I'm ever invited on. Yeah, I don't even know the name of the show. <laughs> I've actually been practicing eating kangaroo testicles for the last five years, just in case. Yeah. For mastermind, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> specialist subject, <laughs> kangaroos knackers. <laughs> Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Hi everyone, we'd like to let you know that this week we are sponsored by uh, Gusto. Yummy! Gusto is the bring it to your house box full of food that you can take recipe cards out of and turn yourself into a Michelin level, my words, chef <laughs> by enacting what's written on the cards. Michelin level, that is so... <laughs> Somewhere. In this house, in That's this house, oh. anything above baked beans on toast is Michelin. I see. It's comparative. Well, no yeah. matter what your current level is, you could definitely improve by getting meals from Gusto. Uh, they have over 250 recipes every month that you can choose from and it makes it much much easier to plan your meals there's very very little food waste and you can have them delivered to your house at any time of the week that's right james i've just started learning how to drive a car gusto is very similar it just slowly builds you into a chef as you eat meal by meal it's really amazing and if anyone would like to try it all you need to do is go to gusto.co.uk and use the offer code fish and you'll get 60% off your first box and 25% then off all boxes for two months. That's right. So head to gusto, that's G O U S T O dot co dot UK and use the offer code FISH. And Dan, can I ask you about these uh, driving lessons? Are you expecting yeah. to become a Formula One driver maybe just after four <laughs> or five lessons? <laughs> That's what I'm telling my kids. <laughs> okay, on with the podcast. <laughs> Not on with the podcast because we are also sponsored this week by Squarespace. That's right. Squarespace is the place to go if you want to start your own website. It is an incredible place. It's so easy to use. And there are so many product features. They have members areas. They have appointment scheduling. They have video studio, email campaigns, connected social media accounts, analytics, all sorts. And that is just the start. I know. Do you remember back in the day when we used to push adverts for build your own website? There was like four features. This is everything you would ever need for a business. You've got everything from online stores through to custom templates. This is a whole new world. This is very exciting. And, and if you do have a website you've been meaning to make, this is the place to do it. So all you need to do is head to squarespace.com slash fish. You'll get a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, use the offer code fish and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website website or domain that's right so go to squarespace.com slash fish and when you go there you will get your free trial but in addition when you're ready to launch use that offer code fish to get 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain and get all of those features on with the podcast on with the show Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that a man called Mike Merrill found making decisions so hard that he floated himself as a publicly traded person and for over a decade now has had over 800 people making his decisions for him. Great. Very clever. So this guy, yeah, so this was back in, I think it was 2007. His career was sort of at a point where he wasn't knowing fully what he was doing with his life. So he decided to separate himself into 100,000 shares and float himself and ask the people who were interested <laughs> purchasing these shares at one buck a piece, would you like to make uh, the decisions for me on Ironically, my behalf? Ironically, that is quite a big decision to make, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah. True. It is. Made yeah. balance. And he kept the majority shares, right? Yes. Oh, but gee. he made his majority shares non um, voting. Oh, yeah. I see. So he didn't have any sway. So no one can own him. 
Yeah, no one can but own him. He doesn't have to make the decisions. But they can rule him. Oh, exactly, wow. they can rule him. But oh. he throws up the the question that he needs deciding. So it's not like they can just say, "We've decided this week, we yeah. want you to dye your hair pink." He has to say, "Should I dye my hair pink?" So he set right. up a website. It's called K Mikey M. And you can go, I went to it uh, in the course of doing the research cool. and I tried to buy some shares, but none are up at the moment because he's, okay. he's very popular at the moment. He sort of releases them in small batches on demand mm. and they fluctuate with the demand. So they could be anything as low as 99 cents, but they can go all the way up to $18. That shares for you. Yeah. And there was, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, has, uh, it, was... Has anyone made a big profit on Mike Merrill? Yeah, his brother who sold uh-huh. when he got to a high point. Really? And the, yeah, yeah, he sold all his shares and uh, bought a new dishwasher, I think, or something. <laughs> <laughs> he does make the decisions about what they vote on but when he moved in with his girlfriend he got uh, complaints from the shareholders <laughs> who said this is a decision I think you should have consulted us on this is definitely going to affect you know oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. it affects the value of him doesn't it yeah. if you get married because yeah. someone else is then not making decisions but helping him make decisions as in if you're living with a partner you do chat stuff over with them they yeah. might have a, an influence on you yeah well the other thing is shares depend on how much he's valued at right yeah. and his value is going to change when his life changes mm-hmm. so the amount of money you have changes when you get married it might change for the better or for the worse but, but are you saying his value would either soar or crater when he it's moved plausible. in with a girlfriend it's plausible yeah. As, and, and, but it's your value on different markets, isn't it? So on the dating market, your value is it sinks when you're. Wanted. Does it sink when you, you couple Although, up from supply and demand? You would think it would increase. Well, you? some people say that. Some people say, <laughs> "Oh, no one's interested in you until you, like, you you move yeah. in with a partner, and then suddenly everyone's after you." You yeah. know. But then is that your experience? No. <laughs> that backfired. <laughs> My experience is total indifference. <laughs> Maintained very nicely, consistently. Thank you. Oh. When uh, when this happened and he had to explain to his girlfriend that she had to <laughs> consult his shareholders, he yeah. issued her with a relationship contract that she had to sign. What? Which sounds bonkers, but yeah. I'm reading that this is it, it is quite bonkers. But also relationship contracts yeah. instead of getting married or before marriage are oh. very well, much on the rise the last few especially, years. Especially, yeah. I think. In the relationship contract, do we know any details, or is it simply? I don't. I don't know the details of that one. Um, Um, I did want to tell you, though, about another relationship (laughs) contract that was in the news recently. Uh, So The Independent reported that uh, Shailene, someone called Shailene, or at Salami Queen on TikTok, uh, (laughs) made headlines because she made her boyfriend sign um, a a relationship contract that said that if he cheated on her, he had to pay all her bills. (laughs) (laughs) Indefinitely. But that's the thing I put, for how long? (laughs) I don't know what he said. And her comment on it was, "I'm, I'm so smart. Or crazy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that feels like it wouldn't yeah. hold up in court, that, I think. It seems oh. unconscionable to me. Apparently it was a know. legal contract, and oh, yet yeah. I don't know uh, if the contract Ooh. just said pay her bills with no other you, parameters. Yeah. You've got to define the terms, haven't you? You've got to define what cheating is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know? Is it casting a flirty glance at someone? In which case he's going to be is it paying ha- bills pretty quickly. Is it hiding money underneath the board in Monopoly? Oh. Right. Mm. Yes. Is it making a cup of tea quietly, <laughs> so you don't have to make the other one a cup of tea? Is it with sleeping with someone else? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. Something like that. We don't know. <laughs> uh, did you hear about Patrick Campbell? No. No. So he owned a company called ProfitWell.com, and he sold it in 2022 for 200 million dollars, and he decided to do a hostile takeover of Mike Merrill. Oh. Uh, and he has since bought 15% of Mike's shares Whoa. and he reckons because you can tell how often people vote and usually his shareholders Mike Merrill's shareholders don't vote most of them it's just a joke and they might right. vote once or twice but they don't really do it mm. this guy Patrick Campbell reckons that with 15% he has enough power to influence all the shareholder votes and he can basically tell him to do what he wants wow, wow. Oh my that's God. amazing that's yeah. exciting but he's still got to only tell him to do what has been presented so right. Mike can still only ask certain questions yeah. and it's up to him but he basically now reckons that he will have the deciding vote on any question that he's asked okay. he thinks Harry. that he reckons Mike's undervalued at the moment and he reckons <laughs> <laughs> wow. well here's the kind of things that he's probably influencing his decisions on so he would have possibly have been part of the decision of whether or not Mike invested in a Rwandan chicken farming business uh, that oh, yeah. was approved by okay. the by the shareholders grow a winter moustache 
uh, that was denied. Mm. No winter mustache oh, happened. Hold up a lip for Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they decided on whether or not Mike believes in ghosts. What? <laughs> he asked, Ooh. do I believe in ghosts? They voted on whether or not he and, does. And? 66% said yes, you do. So he <laughs> does silly. believe in ghosts. I'm sorry, I've been on board with this. <laughs> <laughs> Until that, that makes the whole thing look ridiculous. It yeah, does. It does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. I found it interesting that when he made the decision to embark on this, he valued his life at $100,000 and sold shares on that basis. Oh. Um, that that was uh, that was a very low calculation compared to what uh, economists value your life at, because they have to calculate this in terms of what the government make decisions on. Yeah. Officially, economists think the average human life in the U.S. Mm. is worth about eight point seven million dollars. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, That's a lot. It varies a I'm little rich. bit. So, like the Environmental Protection Agency uses seven point <laughs> four million. Uh, another one uses nine point six million, but. There is a figure on it. How does Andy yeah. get at this? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm theoretically loaded. I don't know that you can access it, but it has what, a huge. What if he cuts off his leg? <laughs> yeah, it's got to be worth one million <laughs> <laughs> on the open market. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But I found That's it so interesting really what high. this what this means to us in terms of uh, rulings in government. So, yeah. for example, in uh, in 1972, um, the auto industry put a life's worth at 885 thousand. Uh, okay. in today's dollars uh, and then two years later so the figure was more or less the same the department of transportation uh rejected a regulation to install bars at the rear of trucks to prevent passenger vehicles from sliding underneath them. so a safety measure mm, right. for trucks was rejected because they did the maths on it and it wasn't cost effective because the lives that it would save oh, weren't wow. worth it right. for the price that it would cost to install them. That's so which interesting. is bleak, isn't that it? Is, yeah. Bleak. Yeah. It's like it would save so many thousands of lives, but they weren't worth enough for but them to do it. I guess there's got to be some kind of calculation. Is it like. <laughs> 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 sorry. Wow. sorry, sorry, sorry. That is in, you're making decisions about a limited amount of resources, yeah. all your income as a country. <laughs> And you're trying to maximise yeah. the human yeah, life. Yeah, we yeah. all agree, I yeah. ran. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, if, is it like if you, you're mountaineering and, yeah. you know, you, you get lost and the government are like, well, he's actually already had $3 million because, um, <laughs> you know, we put him up in hospital that time. Or and the hot, yeah. if you're in one ravine and in the next ravine there's a lot of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> got, it makes more sense for the government to go for the Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah depending on how Bitcoin's doing. You know, it's very variable. Yeah. Well, wow. Food for thought. I mean, yeah. food, big food for thought. <laughs> you know, he, um, the, the calculation was actually, there's a bit more to it, the oh, 100K. Yeah. So it wasn't that he thought that was his full life that was uh, worth that amount. He calculated it based on the fact that he had a day job and that this decision making was only going to apply to his free time. So mm. 100K is based on his nights and his weekends. Okay. So yeah, there's still, mm. so still if you round though, him like, up, it's still low. It's still, yeah. he'd be about a mil, just under a mil maybe, I guess, for the rest of the, and there's bleed between your, you can't separate those perfectly. As in, if you grow a moustache, that'll affect your job. Yeah. Mm. Depending on what you do for a living. It's if you believe in ghosts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you it's, tw it's a 24 seven activity. He works <laughs> in a creepy old house. <laughs> um, this is true. Yeah. yeah. I think it's harder to make decisions uh, uh, everywhere for everybody at the moment because there's this thing about how many more decisions you have to make so there's an economist called Eric Beinhocker I think he was very eminent mm. and famous and he wrote a book it was a huge seller about this uh, kind of thing and he had estimated that between 10,000 years ago and the modern day human choices had multiplied a hundred million fold wow oh my god I have uh, five or six different eye creams in my wow. bedside table <laughs> okay and every night i choose one of those five wow. or six oh, eye creams gosh. based on mood yeah based on mood right um based on vibe and i sort of enjoy that process yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that's just one of the many <laughs> examples yeah. i've walked that. 40 minutes near the office wondering what to have for lunch <laughs> yeah and I've gone into four places and not had lunch in any of them. Back in the day, Andy, you would have been walking around the jungle going, shall I kill that <laughs> buffalo or shall I go after that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that lemon. Yeah. Probably took lemon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Returning yeah. it when it doesn't taste as good. Yeah. That's a bit of a habit of Andy's. Right. Sorry? Remember the time you returned that sausage? I once. <laughs> <laughs> One time! I once went back to a local restaurant. And it wasn't because it didn't taste good, it tasted was it, great. Was it a single sausage? Well, 
<laughs> yeah, and I was eleven pounds down on the transaction. A single sausage, I ask you. We must have the picture of you on the door when you walk in and say, do not allow this man to return his sausage. They gave me another sausage in the end, but by that point, the whole transaction was so spoiled, you know. Yeah. I wasn't able to enjoy either of the two sausages I ended up taking away. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea of you holding a fork with a sausage on the end, walking around the restaurant trying to find the manager, <laughs> tutting. <laughs> It was a takeaway, so I actually I had to go back in. Yeah, we came in. <laughs> so you take the box on trust, don't you? I'm sure this is a nice dish. You take it away, you open it up. I think this is ridiculous. Yeah. Was oh, it a hot dog? Painful. No, no it was no, just no, a no. sausage. Rachel, it was a sausage. No, it was why literally... did you buy a sausage to take away? <laughs> it was a sausage. And... I don't understand the meal. <laughs> it, was a, it was a sausage and rice. Okay. It was so sausage depressing. Was still hard. It was a very nicely spiced sausage, but... <laughs> It was still ridiculous. It what was, was wrong with it? It was too small. It was too. It was eleven quid. One and it small wasn't sausage enough. for eleven quid. This was about five years ago, I should say. This was before the cost of living crisis. This yeah. was, you know, at the time sausages were going for like two quid. You know, right. this is ridiculous. Yeah, this is ridiculous. So you didn't think made. you were getting your money's worth? I didn't, and I went back and I remonstrated for quite some time. But you stay. I mean, we had a good twenty-minute chat here where you were deciding whether or not and building the fury. I mean, it was like. It was, I don't, <laughs> I, this is not me remembering a random thing. This was a big incident. This was Sausage Gate in this office. <laughs> with Andy. Um, I've just got a couple of things on decision making. One of the great ways of deciding is just coin flipping. Mm -hmm. So many things in history have been decided from just doing a flip of a coin. So, um, you know, the company Packard Hewlard. Mm -hmm. um, Hew Hewlard Packard. Packard. That's right, because he won the coin toss. <laughs> and oh, that's why he got named oh, that. Really? It could have been the other way around. <laughs> we could have had Packard Hewlard. Did you say the tide toss? Yeah, it, that's well, and that could have been that called, was a coin toss yeah. that one that way around as well. We worked that out with the computer, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we got we've got Hewlett Packard off the back of that. Um, Portland, we've all heard of Portland, uh, the in city Oregon. in America. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was yeah. meant to be called Boston, but they lost the toy cost. The toy cost. <laughs> what is saying toy cost? We don't keep saying it. <laughs> Should we cost a toy? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. So that should have been called Boston. Wait, but, they um, were trying to call themselves Boston, but what did Boston have to say? I don't think I Boston mean... was called Boston at that point. Oh, okay. I'm guessing. Oh, James thinks it is. <laughs> well, when Portland very... was founded, <laughs> it must have been. Why would they have old, called it Boston it? then? That would just, be another, just, name just another Boston. Just another Boston. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the Wright brothers as well. So um, Wilbur Wright. <laughs> so we're going to be called the Wrong Brothers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should we go in the air or should we go underground? <laughs> <laughs> so Wilbur became the first person ever to fly a plane because of a toy <laughs> 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 and but this was an unfortunate one because Wilbur's first flight didn't go; it didn't work. So the second flight then oh. then went to Orville, who then became the first person to fly a plane. Oh, so sometimes it can go against you. Wow. Yeah, and that's why the duck was called Orville and not Wilbur. Was it? No, no. no. <laughs> he famously Orville. couldn't yeah. fly Harville the duck. I wish I could fly yeah. way oh. up in the sky, but I can't. You can. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I, I'd your... like to pick that, Lauren, as my desert <laughs> island. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. That one's going out for the children and the foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that according to a survey of pubs in 1930, the average time someone in Bolton took to drink a pint of beer was 52 minutes. In Liverpool, it was 22 minutes. Mm. 52 is a long time. Mm. 22 is quite speedy. I've, I'm, I'm in the like 10 to 15 mark, I reckon. What, on average, like if you have five pints in a night, it's, oh, okay, it right. slows down, By doesn't the fifth, it? Yeah, okay. So I read this in a book called Darts in England, 1900 to 1939, A Social History by Patrick Chaplin, <laughs> which I've mentioned before, which is an amazing book, um, which is mostly about darts. And he really does talk about darts quite a lot in this context as well, <laughs> uh, because it was related to a thing called mass observation, which was, it was this thing in Britain where they got a panel of observers and they made a diary about what was happening in their day-to-day -day life. Mm. And the idea is they do it over time and in different places and it would give an idea of what was happening in the country. But anyway, there was this thing in Liverpool that they banned 
darts and actually any pub games. And they thought it was encouraging people to go into pubs. And so they wouldn't let you do it. In fact, Liverpool was the only city in the country where no one played darts in pubs. But what happened was it had the opposite effect. Because you couldn't play darts or pool or dominoes or whatever, you had no distractions. You just drank more because mm. you didn't have anything. You know, if you're playing darts, you have to go and collect the dart and yeah. come back and stuff. And, it's, mm. and you're not drinking. Whereas in Liverpool, they were just getting drunk then eventually they brought sports back into That's pubs so in Liverpool. Is that, is that why? The, yeah, wow. because in Bolton was famously at the time a lot of people played darts and played pool and stuff um, and still do. Oh, that's this really is, interesting. This is weird because I was separately reading about pubs in Bolton. Mm. But, and, but I got a fact from the Mass Observation study. Ah, really? Yeah, so it was in this one was in 1937 and 38. I don't yeah. know whether, is that about the right time? Yeah, 30s. Yeah. So, and yeah, as James says, massive survey of people. But I think they didn't have many people who were from Bolton doing the studying. Yeah. So what they did was they got a lot of middle and upper class <laughs> southerners <laughs> who dressed as northerners yeah. and put on accents and went incognito in pubs in Bolton yeah. and just drank. And um, And you reckon they got away with that? Because I'm from Bolton <laughs> and I don't <laughs> think they did. <laughs> I just what? wonder what it was like. Um, what, so, so what were they doing? They were observing for the mass. I think observing in people's behaviour in pubs wow. and, and recording and to say, you know what was said. And so I just a couple of nice details from this study. One observer uh, who was E L in the notes was rendered incapable of doing any observation after drinking eight pints in an hour and forty five minutes. <laughs> Whoa, that's a lot. They got into a lot of fights. Uh, it was all kind of glossed over. I think it was a pretty inglorious. I mean, episode. if you're a middle class or upper class person from the south going to the north dressed as a northerner <laughs> and doing a fake northern accent, you're going to get in fights. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. And they also had a covert photographer in the corner. <laughs> what dressed as a whippet? Yeah. <laughs> taking secret pictures of, I guess, of the fights as wow, they broke out. So funny. Do you want some uh, pub slang? Sh sure. sure. Yeah. A quiz. Pint hole. <laughs> My mouth. It's not the mouth. Is it oh, not? Oh, no. dear. How are people drinking pints? <laughs> <laughs> you need a funnel. Pint hole. Is it like the cellar where you go and get the beer from? Is that, This is actually the least good answer of the three that I've got. Oh, okay. Okay. It's just the public bar. Oh. Okay, All right. A wobble shop. <laughs> Wobble shop. Yeah. Wobbling like, you know, unsteady because you're drunk. Yeah. It's just another word for a pub again. It's it's an unlicensed pub, apparently. Oh. It's down the wobble shop. Yeah. Do we get unlicensed pubs? Well, not not they're not allowed. But it's quite bold to be <laughs> calling yeah. yourself a pub. Yeah. All right. This one's hard, but it's good. You're you're an admiral of the narrow seas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does it just mean drunk? Oh, it no. is something you do when you're drunk. You sway like you're on a boat. Mm. Very nice. No, Seems. buy some stuff off eBay that you really shouldn't buy. That's it. That's oh. it. It's no. It's drunkenly throwing up into someone else's lap. Oh, oh. I'm an admiral of the narrow seas. <laughs> <laughs> you can say you can right out there. It's okay. <laughs> I'm qualified. Take it up with the navy. <laughs> Come on, Captain Dingle. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Um, there's a pub in Bolton called the Old Man and Scythe. We were talking about Bolton before. It's possibly the oldest pub in the country. It's certainly in the top 10. Uh, and there's a mention of its name from 1251, so we know it's at least that old. But it's where the Earl of Derby was executed in 1651 for his part in the Bolton Massacre. This was during one of the civil wars. Uh, and there's a chair there. It was the last chair he sat in before he was beheaded. Wow. At the Earl of, at Earl the, of Derby. At the pub? It's in the pub, yeah. It's quite very famous in Bolton, this. And they have 53 ghosts. Do in, they? In this pub, apparently, including a ghost dog that's known to lick the manager's feet when he lets them hang out of the bed in the middle of the night. Oh, God. Well, Mike Merrill, if you're listening, you need to get there <laughs> ASAP. This is, but um, that's a lot of ghosts for one pub. It's an old pub, though. It's from 1251. So, you know. Oh, deaths, yeah. Because as I was looking into, is there the most, there's usually the most haunted mm. everything in, in Britain. Oh, yeah. And I couldn't find pub. And that, and then the ones that I read didn't have, they had like four ghosts. So that, this isn't, that's I, huge. Yeah. I would I, imagine with pubs, unlike houses or hotels or anything, because you don't stay there overnight, yeah. it's a lot less spooky, isn't it? Because you can just leave. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. such a fleet. Yeah. You go to the pub for a few hours, but then you go home and also it's like, busy and social so i don't know it's got a lot less spook factor yeah. to it. Pubs, pub, but most pubs outside cities would have rooms wouldn't they 
And you know, oh, there yeah, are taverns, and, you know, Jamaica Inn, that kind of vibe. Oh, well, yeah, a spooky old pub up on the moors, <laughs> and you know, there's a, there's dark I've business going on there. Been to the pub that there. that's based on Have Jamaica Inn. Yeah, I accidentally backed into someone's car. <laughs> wow, you were the real pirate. I know. Well, I went into the bar and told them that I did it. Oh, there okay. Was no, <laughs> there was no problem. But yeah, I've been to there. And also, I've been to what I think is the most haunted, or they say it was the most haunted, which is the Mermaid in Rye. Mm, uh, which okay. yeah, has got a billion ghosts in what, it. What, Rye in Sussex? Uh, yeah, or Kent. Somewhere, it's on the coast, yeah. Rye's in Sussex. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rye is, uh, is a lovely town. It is very nice. Yeah. The Mermaid's a lovely pub. You've been to quite a few supposedly haunted places. Yeah, I'm places. a big fan of them. Maybe. On their own purpose. Maybe I don't believe in any of it. Maybe you're a ghost. That's spooky. Mm. Maybe you're Haley Joel Osmond. <laughs> I don't Grown up. <laughs> Sixth Sense. Oh! He's the kid. <laughs> Sorry, right. Yeah, God, I was watching clips from The Sixth Sense the other day and that, that joke still went over my head. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I love it. Thanks for calling it a joke, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking into drinking beer fast, okay. which is related yeah. <laughs> to yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So um, before we get to beer, uh, the fastest drinker of a fizzy drink, certainly, is a guy called Eric Badlands Booker. <laughs> <laughs> Such a sexy outlawish name for someone yeah. who could just drink fizzy drinks yeah, fast. Yeah. He drank um, a litre of Mountain Dew, the American fizzy drink, <laughs> from a measuring cup in 6.8 seconds. What? Um, oh. And previously his record was drinking two litres in 18 seconds. That was just last year. But um, I came Whoa. across this guy who is a British man called Peter Dowdswell. And he has not only got the record for drinking a pint of beer the quickest, but he's got records in so many food and drink speed competitions. Right. So he had to retire a few years ago when he uh, <laughs> uh, he suffered back and shoulder injuries as he tried to sink a pint while being held upside down. <laughs> <laughs> He was 71. Um, 71? 71? Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, he was dropped twice by the men who were employed to hold his legs. <laughs> who was holding him? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Oh so he God. holds, like, all... Uh, they. He's gone through... He's, he's really, like, belt and braces. Um, yeah. He holds the records for drinking ale, beer, coke, champagne, <laughs> milk, and milk upside down. <laughs> milk upside down, right. And he holds records for eating quickly, raw eggs, cocktail sausages... Pies soaked in Worcester sauce, okay. sushi, Weetabix, sausages upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and my favourite, eating quickly sausages on John Evans's head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What? Do we know who John Evans is? No, I, I don't know. I, John Evans? Just, no? I don't okay. think we're meant to know. Right. Actually, I am impressed by that because it's hard, I would imagine, to eat a sausage off someone's head yeah. because heads are not plate shaped. Oh, no. you see, in my, oh. in my head, he was sat yeah. on the guy's I, head. I thought he was oh. sat on. <laughs> I, I think think you're so. right. I think you're right. Yeah. I don't. Sorry, you're you're correct. I'm sure you're right. Yeah, Evans is probably wasn't... not a plate. Right? I, I think either could be possible. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know that the. Um, I was reading about pub quizzes oh, yeah. uh, and that when they existed, when they first came about. And if you look at the internet, it says that they came about in the 1970s, but I found in the newspaper archives, there was definitely one happening in 1954 in Neath in Wales. So we reckon around just after World War II, um, but probably they didn't exist in 1947 because I found an article about a pub quiz in Sunderland. <laughs> and this was, they advertised it as the pub quiz. And what it was is um, young people could go to a pub and ask a panel of married people about the intricacies of sex. <laughs> oh, wow. And that was wow. called, a, it was called a pub quiz. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? That's... Quizzing someone as in asking yeah, them questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, um... I could do with that. Is that still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I think Being any good wife. pub quiz master will be able to answer some of your questions, <laughs> but not all of them. And you'll have to do it between the rounds as well. Yeah. You know. But yeah, and I think it's like World War Two had just finished. They're trying to get the population up. That's you know, amazing. young married couples have got questions, so they. That's so cool. Oh God, you just finished the music round. <laughs> any questions? Dan sticks his hands up. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's foreplay stuff. Essential <laughs> or optional? <laughs> I wonder what the questions were that were asked. It didn't say. It was just like uh, this is a thing that's happened wow. on the newspaper. Wow, that yeah. would be that would be great if you could ask married people what what it's like 
well, can you remember what it was like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I, rem- I think I remember a question when my mum told me about sex uh-huh. when I was, uh, I don't know what age, like, I think I was nine 19. or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I remember, so she described it to me and I think I remember asking, how, <laughs> how do you both move at the same time? Yeah. Uh, Which yeah. I still think is quite a valid question, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I don't know. I've never had sex, but um, <laughs> the answer ultimately, of course, you know, you just sort of just sort of works yeah. most of the time. <laughs> it just kind of happens. Yeah. Wow. I've just. I did you very first time say to someone, "Hey, don't worry. I know what you're thinking, <laughs> but I've got it covered." <laughs> I spoke to mum. She explained it. <laughs> it you will just, work. It's a to me to you situation. <laughs> <laughs> The Chuckle Brothers were the greatest lovers <laughs> in history. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey everyone, this week's episode of Fish is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. Imagine you're looking for someone who works in comedy, has science-y kind of backgrounds, does facts, and then you get me. Absolutely. The one place you can go to make sure you get the James Harkin rather than the Dan Schreiber when you're trying to hire is LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, LinkedIn Jobs is really easy to use. It's really easy to create a free job post. And when you do so, you Basically, you add this purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile and that spreads the word that you're hiring. Yeah, that's so cool because if you're just on your LinkedIn and you're looking through, every time you see that little purple frame, you instantly know that this is a job opportunity. But it's even better for the person with the purple frame because they've got then all of these tools to help make sure that they've got the right person. They've got screening questions that they can focus on the candidate so they can find the right skills and experience. And they've got options to quickly prioritize who they want to get to the interview it's a really perfect way to reduce the risk when you're hiring absolutely small businesses rate linkedin jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors and you can post your job for free by going to linkedin.com slash fish that's right don't get stuck with the shribes find your harken today by going to linkedin.com slash fish and post your first job for free terms and conditions apply okay on with the podcast on with the show okay it is time for our final fact of the show and that is andy my fact is when he was approached for the role the first actor to play mr blobby was simultaneously appearing in shakespeare's measure for measure (laughs) (laughs) So I just imagine him turning up in the wrong outfit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I wish I knew any quotes from Measures for Measure. Imagine playing other. the Duke of Venice. No. <laughs> um so th- this is about Mr. Blobby. And I think for international lessons we should just quickly say All children. Or ch- <laughs> yeah. Mr. Blobby is kind of like one of the national animals of England, I would say. <laughs> As in, he's a he's a big pink object humanoid and creature yellow. It was humanoid? pink and yellow yeah. he's seven feet tall he wears a bow tie and he screams <laughs> blobby 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 and he wears a big inflatable suit and he just turns up on tv and causes mayhem and i think he mr blobby doesn't wear a big inflatable suit mr blobby is the inflatable <laughs> Sorry. suit yes. yeah. Yeah. it's yeah, not yeah. like inside mr blobby there's a smaller blobby <laughs> no inside there's a man who it turns out is classically trained <laughs> yeah um inside there's just a very big heart <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, basically, Mr. Bobby's been having a bit of a moment because he was really big in the 90s. Yeah. And um, he was on a thing called uh, Noel's House Party, hosted by Noel Evans. Um, and um, he's been sort of back in the news recently. Just there's been a few sightings of him and there's been a costume put up on sale and all this. And I was reading this piece in the New Statesman, beautiful piece by Stuart McConey, uh, oh. all about Mr. Blobby. Uh, and I just wanted to read you this line because um, it's, I think, maybe the most beautiful thing that's ever been written about Mr. Blobby. Malice and stupidity were never far from Blobby's puce bulbous surface. There was surely something of Antonin Artaud's theatre of cruelty in Blobby's defiantly senseless nihilistic interventions. <laughs> He's such a great writer. He's great. And so he basically he would just cause absolute mayhem yeah. and, and break things and, you know, sit on people and, and throw and get in fights and Yeah. <laughs> what was the name of this guy who who played him? He was called Barry Killerby. Barry Killerby, mm. uh, and he's gone off and done other things. He's done mm. bits of acting. He was in Chuckle Vision, for instance, with What's the Chuckle he? Brothers oh, at one stage. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just before COVID, he put on a one-man theatre show about the final days of Harry Houdini. Wow. 
again not in the blobby costume <laughs> he was just doing that um but he has come back and he is doing the blobby um, from time to time he still goes into the blobby suit the reason being that actually is a lot of acting is you know it's a difficult thing to do yeah. to yeah. to get your point across when you're in a massive suit um, but recently he was on this morning on itv and he was punched in the stomach by maggie philbin uh, and the article said that he let out a piercing scream and fell down like a sack of spuds. <laughs> now, what I find interesting about that is that Barry had just done a play about Harry Houdini. How did Harry Houdini die? He was punched in the stomach. He was punched oh, in the stomach. Oh, yes. Barry must have thought it was the end of his days, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Goodness. It's happening God. again. Does Blobby have an appendix? Which <laughs> I think Houdini had appendicitis <laughs> and that's... We don't know Did about he? Blobby's organs. We don't know about the organ structure no. of a Blobby. No, we don't. No. no. That's very exciting. That's really... Oh, God, what yeah. a spot. That's what interesting spot. what your mind does because I definitely thought that Houdini died from getting trapped in one of his boxes oh. with chains around it. And that's obviously something I've just invented in mm. my head from films or something. Yeah, but It no. would be good dramatic irony. Yeah. yeah. Um, Barry was just... While well, we're talking about his sort of mm. al- other life outside of Mr. Blobby... Um, so he he was married once and then he and his wife broke up mm-hmm. and then he got together with someone else. And do you know who it was? Miss Blobby. <laughs> <laughs> it was Mr. Blobby. What? No. Yeah, not Mrs. Blobby, Mr. Blobby. So he was he was split from his wife and he was invited down to the staging of the Crinkly Bottom Castle show. So Crinkly Bottom is where Noel's house party took place. It's where it kind it's of fictional village. Fictional village. Yeah. And they opened up a theme park. They did three in total, which were basically Mr. Blobby theme parks. And part of it was that obviously Mr. Blobby's a character there. So Barry got invited down to teach all the aspiring blobbies how to move inside the suit. And one of the people, one of the blobby apprentices, was this woman who he then got a, on with, and they ended up getting together and moving in with each other. So yeah, incredible. He's with wow. another blobby. Incredible. Yeah, yeah I just, don't know if she stuck it out. Blobby. I mean, I want to know so much about the story. I want to know what Blobby Academy was like. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to see a boot camp montage of Blobby School, <laughs> and then I want to see the moment where she takes off the blobby head, yeah. and he realizes, oh my god. You're the love of my life. And you they know. lean in to kiss, but they can't quite make oh. it. <laughs> I looked at other trained actors in costumes oh, like really? that. So Teletubbies. Yeah. Uh, Simon Shelton played Tinky Winky. Uh, and he was a trained ballet dancer and choreographer. Ah. I mean, many of them, you know, they're just classically trained, you know, actors yeah. and often often uh, dancers because of the movement. Uh, and I don't know if I think we've all got uh, we've, all got, we've all got boys, haven't we, little boys? I've got um, a girl. Oh, you got a girl? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But d- uh, does anyone <laughs> actually delete all of this because it's completely irrelevant <laughs> to what I'm about to say? <laughs> but um, in the Night Garden. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah so that's my daughter's Garden. favorite show. Yes. Yeah, my yeah. boys love it. It's Billy's favorite show. Um, Iggle Piggle yeah. uh, is played by Nick Kellington, who also starred in two of the recent Star Wars films and The Dark Crystal. Whoa. Really? Is that right? There's quite a range. Wow. I read the other day that Little Monster from Justin's House, while we're on there, yeah. <laughs> was also in um, Jurassic Park, like one of the new Jurassic Parks. Okay, playing right. A, a dinosaur? Or... No, so Little Monster's like a little Muppet thing, right. Um, right. but it's the person whose hand is up Little Monster was also up a dinosaur. Wait, so were you, watching, <laughs> were you watching Jurassic Park and some random guy goes, could I get thee? And you're like, I know that hand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, brilliant. didn't Barney the dinosaur? He went on to become a tantric sex instructor. <laughs> the guy who played yeah. Barney. Yeah, there was some controversy, wasn't there, yeah. with Barney the dinosaur? Right. Yeah. Was that what it was? I think that's what he did. That's, he went on that's to do so that. interesting because there was a New York Times article about Mr. Blobby in the '90s saying, "What the hell is this thing in the UK?" And they compared him. They were saying that he's basically Britain's Barney. Yeah. Yes, he's <laughs> very he's very similar, except with chaos, because Barney's a very measured safety, what? health and safety guy. I oh. was reading a piece comparing the two. It's the, the Fence magazine, which is a uh, brilliant magazine, it said Blobby was a dark mirror to Barney the dinosaur. And there was a later Blobby uh, called Paul Denson um, uh, said he was a reaction to that, to Barney the dinosaur, to say, what would England have if it was shite? <laughs> <laughs> That's what Mr. Blobby is. That's so funny. Uh, he was created by a man called Michael Lego. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just like that. Yeah, just in keeping with kids, he was called Mr. Lego. Oh, yeah. Just, can I just say one more thing about yeah, yeah. In the Night Garden? Yeah. It's worth just mentioning while we're on this topic that obviously the narrator of In the Night Garden is National Treasure 
multi-award winning Sir Derek Jacobi. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes. So you've got this, you know, absolutely hugely famous, fantastic actor going, Maka, Paka, Waka, 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 Ooh, my name is Eagle Pickle. Isn't that a pip? Yes. <laughs> that's what I yeah. all the time. But they're all like that, aren't they? It's yeah. like the clang, who does the clangers? It's someone mm. really mm. famous. That was Olivier. <laughs> Late Olivier. Was uh, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Blobby. Oh, yeah. That's that guy again. Please, mister. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. How familiar are you with him? I'm not. I'd love to meet Blobby. It's kind of hard to over how much a big thing Blobby was in the 90s yeah, in Britain. So yeah. was he? So I wasn't here. Huge. Was, yeah, huge. right. Huge. So, Oddly huge. Yeah. Okay. Let's, Dan, you want some stats? Yeah. His Christmas single in 1993 yeah. sold 600,000 copies, uh-huh. which is pretty good. Thank you. Got the Christmas number one. Yeah. Nearly didn't, was knocked off the top spot by Take That the week before, and then reclaimed it the following week to yes. get the Christmas number one. Yeah. Merch included lemonade, bubble bath, knitting patterns, pasta... <laughs> Lampshades. Um, I mean, anything you can imagine had Blobby put on it. Yeah. One of the businessmen involved said that they'd done some research in the 90s and found that every household in the country owned at least one piece of Blobby <laughs> merchandise. Wow. That must have been on average. I think it was. Because <laughs> we didn't have any growing up. No, I don't no. think I would have been I allowed. I had two. Exactly, there we go. There it we worked. go. The system works. Rachel, how many did you have? None. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Anna will have had two. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 knowing Anna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was trying to look into, I'm sure everyone else did, um, other similarities between Shakespeare and Mr. Blobby. <laughs> what and, a great idea. <laughs> and I couldn't find many. I found a couple. One is that, um, one thing they share is that, uh, so this theme park stuff I was talking about, um, there was an abandoned place of one of them, and one of the houses there that survived was called Dunblobbin House, which is what <laughs> he, is that where he lived? Dunblobbin House? Uh, no. Blobby, if he had a house. Well, this was his house. Yeah. Yeah, in the enough. in the place and so they left it and it was abandoned and so what would happen is is that ravers would come and have parties all night long in it and they would just use it as an abandoned party house basically and so the local guy who owned the area was so pissed off that people kept coming that he smashed it down not dissimilar to Shakespeare's um, <laughs> home. Do you remember Where Shakespeare? You is that the link? <laughs> I thought your link was that Dunblobbin sounds a bit like Dunsinane, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. yeah. no, so where, where Shakespeare's oh, house God. was, yeah. there was the um, the owner of it was so sick of tourists coming and taking photos and messing about that he just knocked it down. And so what? we lost Shakespeare's yeah. Yeah, place. Wow. So so there's one similarity. Well, the second similarity. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize you had more. <laughs> I worked really hard, Andy, to find these. So I'll just quickly get this okay, other one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the um, 1993 Christmas single that you you were mentioning yep. in which um it, yeah. there's a very famous video that goes along with it it was a parody video and there's a parody video it's the link <laughs> by shakespeare's sister the oh, band oh, yes yeah. yeah. they parodied that so there's your second shakespeare connection you're Great. welcome Amazing. everyone it's yeah. almost too close actually isn't <laughs> it? yeah. um, it's eerie i was thinking of yeah. links and i didn't put in as much work as dad <laughs> no how could I? <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I was just thinking Measure for Measure, which yeah. Barry Killaby was starring in, yeah. Yeah. is a problem play. As in, there are these three categories of Shakespeare plays, the ha- tragedies, the histories, the comedies, and you know they're all clear. And then there's this fourth quasi-category, which is called the problem plays. And it's basically they don't obey any of the rules of right. any of it. So Measure for oh. Measure is kind of, it has comedy elements, but there's also a really serious okay. um, death penalty plotline. So it's a problem that you can't put it into a category. Is that the problem? Yeah, it's just right. it's more problematic for scholars studying right. it. It's kind of one of these weird. And lots of the later plays are more problem play-ish. I think people say The Tempest is one as well. And I, in a way, Blobby. <laughs> Jesus. Well, he does encapsulate comedy and tragedy, I would exactly, say. Exactly. Ex- exactly. He is comic and tragic at the same time. He puzzles yeah. scholars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah. I think that's watertight. I've got a link between Blobby and uh, Dickens. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow, expanding. Well, this is cool because actually, like, the thing about Noel's house party is they were just looking for something for Noel Edmonds to do. So they gave him 18 different shows that he might possibly do, and they chose this one because mm. it was the best one. Um, but they had complete autonomy, so they could do what they wanted. And they didn't have a commissioner telling them what to do. They didn't have someone at the BBC saying, you can do this or you can't do this. They could do whatever they want. And quite often when you find that in TV, is like people take 
like a lot of care about things and there's lots of like hidden jokes and stuff and apparently there's a bookcase or there was a bookcase on the side of the set that um you never saw you couldn't read any of the books but all the books had got blobby titles oh cool and so there was like blob finger <laughs> instead of gold finger <laughs> oh, and this. martin blobblewit oh. <laughs> it's one of the books that's brilliant. Oh. Yeah. But didn't Dickens have a fake bookcase in his house? He did. He did. He did. He had a bookcase in his house which had fake book titles and it was hiding the door to another room or yeah. a panel or something, but oh. it was or it was above a doorway. And so both Blobby and Charles <laughs> Dickens had the same idea. Amazing. <sighs> Blobby is basically a literary great, is what we're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's huge. Yeah. Um interestingly, we'll never know what Barry Killaby thinks about Mr. Blobby mm. because he's never done an interview. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I only thought you were going to a really macabre end <laughs> <laughs> because he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> no, he. I don't think he'll ever do an interview about it. As in, yeah. lots of people have tried to make contact over the years, and he. Yeah. Ha- I think. I think either he just thinks of it as a job, and he just doesn't want. He doesn't want to become a personality associated with it. Whatever the reason. Yeah. He's never ever done it, and he. It seems like he never will. Interesting. Yeah. I, and he's. Sorry. Go. I was just going to say I like the idea of the people who don't know about Mr. Blobby and. Noel's house party, uh, googling it and seeing <laughs> what it was. Yeah, That's such a treat ahead such of you. Such a treat, and also if if you just see like say a one minute clip of that show, that will in no way explain what happens in the rest of <laughs> no. the show. <laughs> you right. really have to watch our series. Yeah, of I have it. no idea when I see yeah, it. What it is? It was a lot. One of the things you were saying about how so so much weird stuff happened mm. on that show. One of them was MTV. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. So what it was is they would go to someone's house and they would put a camera on their TV and they would talk to them live. Oh, wow, cool. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. It was so cool. And they could win prizes or something. And did they know? know Did they know that was in No, they didn't know. And the amazing thing was when you see interviews with Michael Lego, he basically said every day we didn't know if it was going to work. Right. And you would be stressed out all the way through the week. And the only time you could breathe is when that person didn't, swear or say something terrible live on air Stop or masturbating <laughs> <laughs> oh blobby <laughs> but apparently there was a researcher who would go and meet this person the week before surreptitiously <gasps> and pretend that they were just randomly meeting this person really? didn't tell them they were on tv or anything so get into were their they, house were they, set up were they, the camera were they, were they, were they, were they, yeah exactly but so they're applying the camera to the telly. yeah so someone would have to um, nominate you and that person would have access to the TV. So they make sure you weren't in at the time. But a researcher would just come up, someone you've never met before, and you would come up with some story that they would chat to you to make sure you weren't you know, a person who was going to do something terrible live on TV. I feel like if you flunked out of MI5, <laughs> that would be a job that you could take. Yeah. As in, it's spy adjacent, but mm. you're yeah. not actually doing any spying. I feel yeah. like you would get because the Cold War's finished at that time in the 1990s. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of those a lot of those spies went on yeah. to do NTV <laughs> and Blobby. There was a lot of gunging as well. Oh yeah. On it. Yeah. The gunge, gunge tank. Yeah. Um where uh, sometimes guests wouldn't they get would get yeah. gunge so you'd be in a big glass tank and gunge would fall on you right okay um but gunge featured fairly heavily on british gunge um, was big in the 90s tv yeah get yeah. your own back with yeah. dave benson phillips was, was very gunge heavy oh, so good there's what? someone <laughs> this won't make the edit <laughs> but there's someone a guy on um social media i think it's only on instagram who um i sort of assume it's all women but certainly as um me and a load of uh, women I know constantly comments um, Rachel uh, will you get gunged are you willing to get gunged please respond oh, no. uh, just back on the gunge question <laughs> would love to see you get gunged are you willing always very polite like wants it to be fully consensual right uh, and very persistent like to be fair I don't think I've ever replied <laughs> but like the comments to everyone are the same he just wants to see Wow. Certain people get gunned. Does, does, he, he, does he have the capacity to gun? I don't, I mean, I does haven't, he, do I don't think I should ask. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he'd take that, that as, a, as a what's maybe. Your, just, just, just ask, what's your setup? Like, <laughs> is he like, using a classic '90s gun recipe, or is this him? Has he recreated his own gun in a oh, sort I of? I don't like to think of that. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> well, or is it someone who worked on '90s television? Yeah, and oh, has wow. kind of picked up this fetish. He's got yeah. all this leftover gun <laughs> after the show got cancelled. <laughs> what am I going to do with this gun? It reminds me of the story. I, this isn't my story, so I'm not sure if we can keep it in. But you know, Rich Turner, our very good friend, yeah. who Dan and I work with a lot, and as a 
radio producer and uh, worked on TV for many, many years. He worked on a kids show in the 70s for the BBC. Uh, and he said that there was a child and they kind of, they've been, gu- it wasn't gunged, but there was like a flower fight, you yeah, know? Okay. So they're covered in flower like this. And then someone on set had to shout out, can someone deflower this child, please? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only time that was ever heard in the 1970s <laughs> at the BBC. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Will You Be Gunged? (laughs) (laughs) At Rach. At Rachel Paris. Yeah, and uh, remember, uh, as we said at the top of the show, you can see Rachel live on stage as part of the great ostentatious ensemble. It is such an amazing night. It's live improvised Jane Austen novels that have never been performed before. They've been written, uh, over, I think 6,000 of them or something <laughs> like that, right, that were yeah. lost to time, have been found. <laughs> they perform a new one each night, and that's on in the West End. So do check out online to find tickets for that, or make sure to get her book. It is now out in paperback, Advice from Strangers. It's out March 23rd. It's where Rachel spent basically a year of stand-up life going around the UK and in Edinburgh, taking advice from strangers and working out the answers and working out what the philosophy of what they were saying, meaning it, it's a brilliant book it's out now in paperback so do check it out and do come back next week we'll have another episode waiting for you we'll see you then goodbye <laughs>